This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser on Bloomberg Radio. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week on this Thursday. A lot going on. Quick check on the markets because we're seeing the risk trade off. Some concerns. Once again, a reminder, we are in a global pandemic. And that is certainly impacting everything when it comes to our world. 1.3% lower on the S&P, down 1.5%, almost 1.5% on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And we've got the Nasdaq down about eight-tenths of a percent. All right, do you want to get into something that kicks off on Monday? We're talking about the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. It kicks off virtually four days of incredible global, global programming with a blockbuster lineup of leaders. And they cover kind of all the global concerns that we need to be talking about. It's also, by the way, our cover story this week. Let's get into it with Business Week Economics Editor Christina Lindblad. She's in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. And also with us, Bloomberg Business Week Editor Joel Weber. He is on the phone in Brooklyn. And Joel, you have an array of stories in the magazine that relate to the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. That's right, and, and really Christina was the architect of this little package of stories, and, and uh, she did a great job, and that was one of the reasons that um, I wanted to have her on the show today. And obviously t- we talked about Zelle yesterday, which yeah. is, um, a r- I thought, just a phenomenally interesting one um, in regards to Venezuela and sort of how uh, people there are making use of it to do something that, you know, the company, and, and you know, Zelle never intended to have happen. Um, And that's just sort of an example, I think, of the approach that Christina used throughout the issue is sort of like, how do we tap into some of these biggest challenges that that we face, that humanity faces? And obviously that kind of starts with the pandemic, since that is the, you know, one of the stories of the year for sure. Um, Christina, can you take that and kind of lay out um, what what you learned about this story by Jason Gala and Long Haulers? Yeah, thanks, Carol, for having me on. I've been interested in the long haulers for a while because I think we were also focused for every day still on infection rates and hospitalizations and 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 that. But also to understand that there are people who, some of them have symptoms that are so bad that they're almost disabled. They cannot go back to work, and it's been several months, and and that the scientific and health community can't answer the questions that they have about whether they're ultimately going to be done with this you know how long is are they going to have these symptoms well and it's interesting christina considering um you know i think there's sometimes some populations (laughs) being kind of cavalier about COVID 19 and you have to remember that you know some people get it they don't have a lot of um, you know, leftover effects, if you will, and then other people get it and it stays with them, as you just said, for a really long time. It's just a reminder that this virus impacts us all in very different ways. That's right. Actually, one of the things that we found is that sometimes people who had no symptoms or very light symptoms actually had the biggest problems with, you know, the sort of long term viral um, hangover, you would say. <coughs> And, you know, the the other hangover that um, we're all going to kind of be faced with here is the economic implications of this because COVID can have multi-organ impacts and implications. Right. And we're also starting to see that there will be an impact in terms of disability. What, what does that mean for all of us, Christina? Well, that's, I think, we talked to several researchers who are trying to answer just that question and something they're starting to grapple with. I mean, there have been comparisons to polio, for instance, to try to um, have long-range estimates of what would it be like if there had been no vaccines that, you know, they came in at the right time. And I think that's going to be important here, obviously, the vaccine, you know, not to have more infected population, but we still will have to answer the questions of how we help people who um, have damaged their organs, their hearts, um, and sometimes need um, not just pulmonary rehabilitation, but they're also having, what people describe brain fog. It's <clears throat> so, Christina, I want to talk about um, Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economic Story. Uh, which sort of talks about how they've done, they've crunched a bunch of numbers to try and figure out sort of what the path of, of global economies is going to look like over the next couple of years and decades. And, and they go so far as to say, right about 2035, we're going to see a shift in terms of um, free market economies being overtaken by, by state-driven ones. Um, can you talk about wh- where else he goes in that story and what it means for, for us? 
Can I just say, too, this is a must-read. Like, everybody has to read this to kind of understand, I think, where our world is going, Christina. Yeah, I think you did a good job of laying out where we're going to be at mid-century and, and to put numbers to something that we've been tracking for a while, which is the, the sort of, some people have said the Asian century, you know, like that this, this century belongs to Asia. And so overall, emerging markets um, at the start of the century were about 20% of GDP, but, you know, through by 2050, they'll be more than half, almost 60%, and China will be by far, you know, the biggest um the biggest part of that and we have this great graphic that sort of shows the reordering of the top 10 economies you know and basically china bumps the u.s off the number one slot india bumps japan out of number three slot and you know and you see sort of the kind of youthful developing markets you know moving up and the sort of aging economies moving down I got. I have to say, like I said, this is a must read. But there's a line in the story. It's optimistic to assume that all these transitions will be smooth. Ha! Like it's going to be uncomfortable, right? As these changes happen globally. Well, we've seen in the last four years, and even now, when Biden, you know, may, will assume office, th that um, the the big power struggles that are going on, right? They're going on in the field of trade, of IP, you know, and all these different dimensions. I mean, there's this idea that, you know, that it's, there's bound to be conflict when there are these, these sort of um, disruptions in, in, the, in the sort of established order. Um, Christina, I also wanna uh, talk about the other uh, elephant in the room, hmm. which is climate change. And I know Eric Ross 